A very good morning, everyone. I extend a very warm welcome to each one of you on behalf of the finance and investment cell, Shriram College of Commerce. And thank you all for joining us today for the launch of Finance and Investment Cell, SRCC, 12th edition of the annual finance journal, Vitta. I wish to extend our heartfelt gratitude to our honorable chief guest, Mr. Rajiv Mimani, our teacher advisor, Ms. Bhavya Bansal, for joining us for this session today. We also thank our respected principal ma'am, Professor Sindhu Kaur, for her constant support and guidance. The Finance and Investment Cell of Sriram College of Commerce was founded with the goal of increasing interest and disseminating knowledge to students in the fields of finance, economics, and geopolitics. The cell provides an amalgamation of theoretical expertise and practice by stimulating the development of financial instincts in young minds through events, frequent workshops, and ongoing industry collaboration. Our annual publication, Vitta, is the perfect blend of expert opinions and insightful interviews with over 30 articles that uncover edge-cutting topics. It condenses complex financial theory, explores several industrial disruptions and diagnoses different problems in financial markets and offers a multifaceted view of global events. This year, we are honored to have the opportunity of launching Vita in the August presence of Mr. Rajiv Mimani, the chairman and regional managing partner of EY India and a distinguished alumnus of Sri Ram College of Commerce. Mr. Mimani also serves as the chairman of EY Global Emerging Markets Committee. He spearheaded EY India's industry-leading strategy and transactions prior to taking up his present position. He has also worked in Singapore with EY India Tax and Assurance Services. To share his profound knowledge of the corporate world, Mr. Mimani has served on a variety of policy advisory committees of the Indian government. He has been nominated as a part of a task force of the Ministry of Finance that drafted a new direct tax law. He is a member of the National Council of the Confederation of Indian Industry and the chairman of its National Committee on Tax. Mr. Mimani is truly an idol for corporate leaders and young minds alike. We are beyond honored to have you among us today, sir. It is now my honor to invite Ms. Bhavya Bansal, the teacher advisor of FIC SRCC, to, ad to address the gathering. Thank you, Alia. I welcome you all to the launch of the 12th edition of ITA. FIC, SRCC Annual Finance Magazine. Congratulations to the entire FIC team. Over the years, the finance and investment cell has done outstanding work since its founding in advancing knowledge in the fields of finance, economics, and geopolitics. The cell continually generates original and motivational ideas and offers its members numerous opportunities to shape their ideas through helpful publications, including the annual journal Vita, newsletters, and website blogs. This year's edition with her covers a plethora of relevant sections that covers the convergence of finance and the digital realm, bizarre economic findings, policy responses to social and economic issues, geopolitical and international relations complexities, the tactics used in financial scandals and frauds, as well as methods to avoid them, and finally, sustainability and strategies to mitigate climate change. It also features articles and interviews transcripts of experts in their respective fields, including corporate leaders, founders of startups, and visionaries featured in lists of Forbes magazine. On behalf of the faculty and students of SRCC, I wish to thank Mr. Rajiv Mimani, the chairman and regional managing par partner of EY India, for agreeing to launch with our 2022. Thank you so much for your kind words, ma'am. Your guidance and support mean everything to us. While we've all often heard a single conversation across the table with a wise man, is better than years of mere study of books. Today, we hope to learn and grow with the wisdom of the man who's been at the helm of the industry for many years now. He has advised clients across sectors and worked closely with several of the largest conglomerates in India. Thank you so much for joining us today, Rajiv, sir. As students about to enter the corporate world, we would be delighted to ask you a few questions. We sincerely request your permission to begin with the questions. Yeah, yeah, absolutely, please, please carry, please. Thank you so much, sir. So, so the first question that we have is that as a finance and tax leader, 
you were also quite involved in various government of india committees including the ministry of finance so so what role in your opinion does a leader of the private sector play in government functions and what has your personal experience been like yeah antra firstly uh, thank you to you uh, and your team and bhavya ma'am for uh, very kind words of introduction i'm uh, privileged for that uh, and i must say that one of the most uh, pleasant experiences for me and also uh, something that i probably take the maximum amount of pride in is the three years that i spent in srcc uh so my congratulations to all of you during our time it was much easier to get in but i now know that you have to be whatever above 100% to get into sri ram college of commerce so my congratulations to all of you so i know that i'm uh speaking to a very distinguished uh, group of uh, of youngsters who i'm sure uh, will leave their own impact uh, uh in in india and 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 many of you outside india so congratulations to all of you for getting into Sri Ram College and for organizing this, uh, uh, you know, uh, FIC and also I briefly scrimmed uh, through Vita, which is really uh, seems to be an outstanding publication. So, compliments and congratulations to to all of you. Uh, uh, to answer your question on uh, uh, on the interaction with government, I would say that firstly, I I I feel that it's a real privilege uh, because to be uh working uh, as a private sector person uh, uh getting an opportunity to work through committees and others uh with the government i think uh, the impact that you can create uh, and the scale of impact that one can create is is really tremendous and um uh, and you know the also the ability of uh, your bringing your own knowledge and experience um Uh, to be here on some of the important policy issues is very very important so i'm uh, i would say you know a few key learnings for me has been that when you enter into government or when you interface with government committees and others the first thing you have to do is that there has there is no self interest in this so you may have certain positions there may be some things that benefit your organization or benefit you individually i think you have to leave that behind uh, the second thing is uh there is a lack of trust between private sector and government so whenever you go into some of these committees and some of these groups the main thing is how do you regain and rebuild the trust so everyone's interest is to do the best thing uh, for the country although you know perspectives vary massively but the you know if we can settle the first thing of building trust so that people are open and uh, receptive to ideas from each other um, uh, that is very very important the third is uh, government uh, you know when we look at from outside we don't realize but the government also works under a lot of constraints uh, so you know how do you uh, and have a better appreciation and understanding uh, of those constraints uh, i think that is very very important uh, and also articulating the viewpoint of industry uh, in a way that it's not all miss always self serving uh, but it's also something which is in the broader interest of the economy and the country i think that's very very important the the finally i would say is that you know there always you always want to do the ideal thing what you believe is right and probably the best solution uh, but in reality a lot of times uh, because of constraints or because of different viewpoints or differing viewpoints uh, you cannot do in your view what is the best and what you don't want is you don't want the best to be the any enemy of good so you try and move as long as you can build consensus and even if you can't achieve 10 but if you can achieve 6 or 7 or 8 uh, that's very good so so that's been my approach uh, uh, is really to build trust uh, have a better appreciation of the other side's perspective bring in your own perspective and try and see how you move things forward uh, rather than just waiting for the perfect uh, solution thank you so much for this answer sir and definitely we have a now we have a better understanding of how creating synergies across private and government sector is you know essential to basically scale up the impact for the betterment of the economy as a whole so thank you so much for that answer sir yeah. the next question that we have is that so india just celebrated 75 years of independence and we've definitely seen tremendous growth over these years So, so, what sectors, in your opinion, are going to be the key growth drivers for the economy in the next decade? Yeah, 
So uh, uh, I would say it's a pretty momentous occasion uh, celebrating 75 years, especially if you see uh, what's happened and what's happening around uh, our neighbors uh, who got independent uh, independence around the same time. So uh, the only thing I would say is that 75 years is a short time to to judge uh, any country because you know India has been uh, under you know some form of foreign rule, colonial rule for hundreds of years. So in that way, 75 years is a uh, is a pretty short time frame. I mean, if you look at uh, just the British rule and, you know, East India Company and then the British rule, you know, you're talking about a couple of hundred years. Uh, the second thing, you know, the first few decades uh, in India, whilst we received political freedom, but we really received economic freedom from 1991. Uh, and from 91 onwards, uh, you know, I think the uh, uh, journey has been pretty clear. Uh, you know, there's much greater freedom to do uh, uh, business, uh, expand, grow. And I would say progressively it's become better. Uh, you know, if I, if I look at the last five years, last 10 years, the things that have happened on technology, digital and everything else have been, have been really remarkable. So, so I would say, firstly, I would say is that, you know, the, the next, 25 years of India, uh, and I truly believe in this. I'm not being rhetoric. Truly, is you know should be the India's Amrit Kal. I mean, I think the uh, the future is very bright. Future is very promising. Some of you may have read the Economic Times uh, story today on the front page of this is not only India's decade but India's century by the global CEO of McKinsey. <coughs> so, so I think this is uh, a very promising period for India, provided we have. Uh, political stability, uh, we have good governance, um, and inequalities or social strifes don't become so so much that they pull the country back. So, you know, if we have that broad, the opportunity for India to strike is very, very high. And one of the main reasons for that is the, the institutions that we have built, uh, the quality of education that we have, uh, the in, when I talk about the institutions, I'm not only talking about the educational institutions, but also about you know the uh, the judicial system, the uh, financial infrastructure that we have built, the stock exchanges, the financial institutions, uh, the democratic framework. Uh, in many of them, it may not be perfect, uh, and people may have different views on whether it's effective, whether it's not effective. But I would say that especially the financial infrastructure that India has built. And the technology that India is building around that is probably amongst the best in the world, whether it's the stock exchange, whether it's SEBI, whether it's the other, uh, you know, framework that's been built around the uh, stock exchange. So, so, you know, in this context, I would say if I have to look at the most promising sectors, I think for India, no doubt it is technology. And, uh, you know, today, uh, most of the global organizations uh, have their largest uh, pool of talent in technology and innovation in India. Uh, and, and, and in some cases, just the largest pool of talent in India. If I just look at EY, uh, overall, we have, uh, you know, 400,000 people around the world, out of which almost 100,000 would be in India. So, uh, you know, when you have of a large global organization, uh, which is largely, uh, you know, today in terms of size, is much bigger in Western Europe. If almost 25 in Western Europe and US in the Western part of the world, if 25% of the uh, of the talent pool sits in India, I think that's a reflection of what Indians today uh, from India are doing around uh, the impact that they're having around the world on technology, on innovation, and everything else. The way Indian IT services are companies are growing. Uh, you look at the Indian SaaS companies that are coming up, uh, the software companies, the analytic, analytics companies. Uh, so I would say uh, technology to me would be one sector uh, that will continue to hold a lot of promise. India is uh, the, the digital factory of the world. And as the world pivots more and more towards the digital side, I think the opportunity will only, only, only grow. The second thing I, I would, you know, and related to this is the, and which I briefly mentioned, the digital infrastructure that India has built today uh, and the, uh, with the, uh, the, the impact of mobile and mobility, uh, the startup ecosystem or the new new age companies, uh, I think they are also very, very promising uh, in the way they will show growth. Yes, they will have ups and downs and everything, 
but i would say that's another area uh, and we can probably spend more time on that uh, will be uh, you know will be another area of growth the uh, going forward the third would be you know uh, from a sustainability standpoint and i think you've covered some of these issues in your in your magazine also uh, the way india is approaching solar uh, the way india is approaching wind energy uh, the way in, some of the large indian conglomerates are putting in you know tens of billions of dollars in figuring out what the hydrogen story is and the and almost each and every business is trying to see how they can make their business more sustainable and do things differently um you know i think that in itself is creating a massive uh, opportunity and a massive play so i would uh, uh, i would say the the ecosystem that gets created around sustainability new business opportunities new businesses uh, i think that will be very positive and related to that is india has been behind on manufacturing you know we have almost just 16 17% of our gdp that comes from manufacturing but i do see that you know as we are seeing in mobile phones in technology and in very labor intensive industry uh, because of the geopolitical issues and the tension that's coming up with china and the red theme around atmanirbhar bharat uh, you know because of that manufacturing industry will also get a lot of impetus Uh, in india so so i would say that uh, you know the technology uh, startups uh, themes around sustainability um, you know manufacturing coming up and then traditional growth areas of india which is financial services because if you're going to grow at 7 to 8% gdp uh, in the next 10 15 years you need capital uh, you need a more inclusive financial services system so anything that is around in and around financial services will continue to grow i think overall i would say india has tremendous growth across sectors uh, but some of these sectors that i mentioned about i think they will probably see just a very different shape thank you so much for your answer sir we definitely have a very good pass to appreciate the journey that we've covered thus far as a nation that is definitely uh, to be appreciated for and as you mentioned technology startup sustainability and the traditional growth areas so for sure the next 25 years are going to take us to another tangent following up uh, with respect to the technology that we talked about sir uh, we've seen that digitization and ai technologies are basically woven into the fabric of every industry in today's time so so from your experience what skills and mind sh- uh, mindsets uh, should the workforce nurture to be successful in this increasingly technology centric world yeah i mean i think it's a it's a very good question uh, and you know i think technology is going to be infused uh, in everything that one does so even for youngsters like you and all of you are probably pretty much more adept on technology in many ways your native digitals because you you know you've just worked and grown with technology but i would say even for you one of the main things is technology the speed at which it is changing uh and earlier our education system you almost felt that okay i have finished my school i have finished my college i have taken a professional degree and your education kind of stopped there uh i would say the, the most important thing now is to be constantly learning uh and because things are changing so rapidly and as as uh bill gates said that you know you want leaders who are not know it all but you know who are they they're more learn it all so you know just trying to be much more open um, to the changes that are happening around you always be on the lookout of uh, you know just absorbing more i think that that is very critical uh, in the new world and especially in the newer areas of technology and application of technology not just how do you build a software or how do you code but how do you apply technology differentially is very important uh second is I, i think creative thinking is very important a lot of times the indian education system to strengthens you a lot with rote learning so your ability to absorb uh you know hundreds of pages in in matter of hours uh digesting that remembering that i think that's a great strength we have but just problem solving and creativity uh you know if we can pivot that and i think the system prepares you very well for that but if you can pivot that much more towards uh the uh, problem solving towards creative thinking i think that's uh, that is very very that i think is very very important 
and third uh, which which uh, i think the way education is going to go forward uh, is is much more interwoven learning so you know you will have um, you know students who are doing economics who are doing commerce along with that doing philosophy literature or doing computer science so just having a fuller perspective uh, because we are going to live in a world where uh, problem solving in future will involve much greater uh, teaming and collaboration uh, and it will not just be you will obviously need deep specializations in some things but having a wider understanding uh, of um, of different subjects uh, both liberal arts uh, sciences and others i think that will become very important so if you look at it's already happened in the us but even in india i think you will see more and more of the newer universities that will come up will be focusing much more on interwoven learning much more on you know having sort of knowledge of multiples so that i think prepares you much more for the digital world uh, for you know whether you talk about deep ai analytics uh, you know the the you know the more you have creative thinking the more you are always looking out for learning uh, working as teams collaborating better appreciation of multiple subjects uh, i think that prepares you much better for the um, digital world uh, uh, going forward because whether tomorrow you know whether you are a finance professional or whether you are a, a marketing person you know technology and digital is just completely changing uh, the way business is being done the standard routine stuff is all getting digitized process machine will do it the question is the incremental stuff is what will be done uh, by the humans and how do you prepare yourself uh, for incremental things is very important how do you prepare yourself to say some problem comes how do you approach a problem uh, maybe you have not studied about that maybe you have not worked about that around that but how do you how does your mind work to say okay this is the problem how do i go about uh, looking at different facets and see how i solve a problem so i think that's what in future i mean it's been the past as well so it's not something new but in future the great there will be far greater emphasis on that all right thank you so much sir this answer definitely had a lot of uh, key takeaways especially for students like us who were like you know about to enter into the industry so definitely creative thinking and having a fuller perspective and definitely constantly evolving uh, these are important things uh so another thing that we talked about was the startup culture so over the last few years we've witnessed this stupendously increasing interest in startups so, so what do you think are the driving factors influencing the youth to opt for startups instead of uh, established firms these days and how sustainable do you think this trend is yeah no no i think i tried to address a little bit of that earlier but let me just cover it in more detail so what what are startups why have they come up Uh, there were entrepreneurs earlier also <clears throat> but this scale has come up uh, what we you know whether it's you we classify them as unicorns or and there are tens and thousands of startups that are coming i'm sure a lot of you will end up doing your becoming entrepreneurs and end up starting you know doing your own startups but i would say the way technology has evolved in the world and and also uh, you know mobility uh i uh, i think it has uh, fundamentally between technology and broadband and mobility uh the you know lot of the unmet needs of people uh are are you know can potentially be solved and also the ways in which industry used to operate um you know if we had four layers doing something now only in one layer you can do it uh you know you can reach directly to consumer instead of goods going from your from the factory to the dealer to the distributor to the dealer to the retailer and then to the eventual consumer now it can probably go using technology it can have maybe just one intermediation or it can go directly and and and, and reach your homes and likewise in every industry uh, earlier it probably uh, took and you won't realize it but uh, in in rural india it may have taken months for someone uh, to set up a bank account now it can be done in a matter of minutes so and that's the opportunity because of that the opportunity that startups had to completely reinvent how business is being done to completely relook at what are the unmet needs of people uh, i think that is becoming uh, uh, and and business models which earlier couldn't have been possible are now coming to fore and you know so if you have that kind of thing and then you back it up in countries like india where people have a tremendous entrepreneurial mindset 
there is no fear uh, of scaling businesses. So just a mindset of saying that, how can I scale at a different level? And third, capital. Uh, so availability of free capital, which was earlier very constrained, and a lot of that capital has come from outside India, large. You know, if you look at the entrepreneurial mindset, the ability to scale and the availability of capital, coupled with the technology, mobility, broadband, things that happen, it just created an environment where you had an explosion of new companies who looked at business in a very different way. Uh, and they were younger people uh, like all of you uh, who were not, uh, uh, you know, didn't have any baggage of experience. Uh, looked at the world very differently, had a very positive mindset, had a capital that was backing them. And, and they focused very intensely on growth uh, because that's what the capital providers were seeking. And, 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 and so there was a massive entrepreneurial excitement that we have seen over the last three to five years, specifically, I would say, in the last 12 to 24 months. And when you have an environment like this, you will have uh, blips. Uh, you will have companies who probably have not focused so much on the fundamentals, but have focused very intensely on growth. You may have some cases uh, where they have crossed the line in terms of what's good governance and what's, uh, you know, data privacy and other issues. So the the process will grow through, or the this this um, entire cycle will go through some level of correction. Uh, but I have no doubt in my mind that uh, you will have new companies that will come up. These will be global scale companies. Uh, they will have not only impact in India, but they'll have globally. Uh, and But before that, you'll have some pain, uh, you'll have some consolidation. Um, we may have some blow-ups as well. So, but, but, the, but, but if you forget the blips in between, and if you just look at the secular trend, the secular trend is, uh, you know, these companies, these new age, new commerce companies will redefine the way business is being done in India. If I look at, uh, you know, to sort of the answer, the second part of your question was, you know, when youngsters like you step out, uh, you have a choice of saying, you know, uh, should I be joining a Unilever or should I be joining a Flipkart? I mean, I'm just using those two as examples because uh, they're two, uh, or should I be joining an, uh, uh, you know, uh, Amazon versus a Nestle? So, so I would say both are positive because when you look at companies, uh, which are more established companies, uh, you know, whether they're Indian companies or multinationals, you learn a lot in terms of management skills, uh, uh, discipline, um, you know, uh, understanding the basics of business. Uh, again, we're working in a team, collaborating and everything else, which is very useful. And when you look at startup, you just see raw energy, you see an entrepreneurial mindset. And maybe these organizations, which are very young organizations, still have to have evolve into a level of management maturity. So, so the learning in terms of management principles and everything are much more, I would say, much more disciplined in matured companies. Their ability to take in talent, let that talent go through the entire process is, is different. But the sheer understanding of how the new world operates uh, and the entrepreneurship uh, uh, and the raw aggression that you see, that you see in startups. So depending on uh, you know, what you want, uh, and how you want to shape your career and what are the opportunities, frankly, that one gets. Uh, I think they're both positives and negatives in both of them. But I, I wouldn't say negatives, but they're positive. They're learnings in both of them. They're not negative, but they're learnings in both of them, which are very useful as you build up your career or I'm hoping as many of you want to become entrepreneurs in your own right. Thank you so much for that answer, sir. Uh, I know we're going to like we're exceeding the time a bit but this one question i personally also like really wanted to hear from you about this so i'll just go ahead and ask it sustainability is on the minds of the young generation and they're asking for an increased role that corporates need to play in giving back to the society so so how important do you think is it for big corporates to take this seriously and as we all know, EY has also a very well-established foundation for the past 15 years. So could you please tell all of us more about the foundation's work, the challenges that you've had to overcome and like your vision for this mission, basically? Yeah. So, so let me first start with uh, uh, ESG, uh, as you said, and you talked about sustainability. Uh, 
so ESG has an environmental impact, has a social impact, has a governance impact. Uh, you've talked more about the social thing, but let me just spend a little bit on the entire ESG thing and I'll come to our foundation as well. I think uh, ESG uh, became very important topic, has been a very important topic. And um, as you have a society which is uh, threatened with some of the climate changes, uh, and as you have more and more inequality that's happening, although a lot of people have come out of the poverty, uh, uh, you know, grown above the poverty level, but you still have a very, very unequal society and you also have massive environmental impact. So because of that, ESG as a theme uh, has been bubbling, but in the last two, three years has really picked up. Because of geopolitical issues, the war in Europe right now, I think it's taken a little bit of backseat, but I do believe that in a year or two from now, as things settle down, this will once again acquire prominence. And if I look at Indian companies, I think uh, uh, Indian companies are taking a lead. Uh, I talked a little bit about new business opportunities that are coming through ESG. If I look at our own practice, our sustainability practice is one of our fastest growing practices um, because more and more companies are trying to see uh, because their customers are asking, uh, because the capital providers are asking, and they think that if they have to create long-term value for their shareholders and the broader set of stakeholders, the progressive companies believe that unless they don't address the ESG agenda, they will not progress. So whether it's from an environment standpoint, uh, whether it's from a governance standpoint, uh, how they use energy, uh, how for each of the raw materials that they're using, can they use a more sustainable raw material? Uh, the way they're dispatching the goods, can they look at e-mobility and logistics so that you know it's more environment friendly? Uh, so all aspects of environment. And likewise, as you know, India has, uh, we, uh, you know, in corporate India have to give 2% of their profits or allocate two, at least 2% 2 of their profits through for social, um, uh, uh, you know, and uh, identified uh, areas of philanthropy and others. So, so I think that more and more companies are doing, uh, you know, societal issues, whether it's from a gender standpoint, I'm seeing that's being addressed more and more. Uh, uh, also from a, from a uh, you know, people with different abilities, you know, how do you address them? I think that's also, that's also happening. So I, my, my, my sense is that on, on the, ESG standpoint from what we saw earlier to what we're seeing now, I think things are getting much better. And I think Indian companies are doing very well on that score. There's always scope to do more. The, uh, from an EY foundation standpoint, almost uh, 15 years back, uh, we decided, and we're not, we don't, we are a partnership. So we don't, you know, this law doesn't apply to us in any way this law came in 2012. The, we, we contribute a certain percentage of our revenues to what is EY Foundation. Uh, and uh, we decided to do that because we felt that if you were to operate in the Indian ecosystem, <clears throat> if you're not giving back to the society in a very disciplined way, uh, then you can't be, uh, you know, be an active member of that society. So we have been doing that. Uh, we started by saying that uh, since our core is knowledge, that we should first look at the education system. And we worked with the Delhi government uh, in a lot of their education initiatives. Um, and then uh, uh, we, we created a scholarship scheme, uh, which is called Disha, uh, where we have uh, you know, almost 3,000 children now. Uh, and every year we are adding almost to 5,300, where children who get more than 70, 75%, but because of their family conditions, <clears throat> they're not in a, in a position where they can carry on their education after class 10. We provide them scholarship, other social uh, education, um, you know, training them on English, um, other issues that make them more successful. So that's something uh, we are trying to address. Uh, and as you can imagine that almost two thirds of the people that we provide scholarship to are girls. Because the way Indian society is, if you have three children and you have, you, your income is very low, uh, and if you have two boys and a girl, the, probably the two boys will get the, the education and the girl won't. So a lot of that uh, is something that we do. Uh, and, uh, and also our people are getting involved in trying to see how they can mentor these children, how they can coach them so that they become more successful as they go. 
the what we then realized is that as we go into urban india uh, rural india and others that just fixing education won't help you have to actually try and see how you raise income levels and the best way to raise income levels is to empower women if you empower women uh, you know then the health standards come up uh, you uh, you know they are much more serious on 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 providing education to their children and then so in rural india our approach has been working with ngos uh, who are uh, who help in creating these women self help groups and empower women make them entrepreneurs uh, you know add to the income of the family so if you can you know if income can go up to 10 15000 rupees uh, then automatically health education other social things get get taken care of so we are working uh, across sort of hundreds of villages uh, um, uh, and empowering almost uh, 300000 uh, women around uh, india in you know in working with ngos so that they can work through. and this is absolutely in the most rural parts of india uh, and uh, and and that's been a big uh, that's something that we have been doing and likewise there have been many other initiatives the third thing now we are trying to see is on the environment standpoint Uh, we believe water is a big issue so starting from whether it's just planting lots and lots of trees around the country but also trying to see how we can work uh, either with uh, policy and think tanks um, uh, or uh, rejuvenating some lakes around so that you know the issue of water we think long term will become very very critical so so from education to providing uh, uh, you know uh, raising income levels by empowering of women in in uh, better agricultural practices in in rural india to addressing esg issues whether it's the issue of paddy in punjab or or, or some of the other areas uh, and basically uh, a lot of it is around trying to see how we can work with other ngos and how do we work with government because we believe government has the infrastructure government has the capital but if we can make the government more efficient and implement the policies that makes a big difference so we are working with an ngo uh, by the name indus who which you know as you know there's a government policy that in every uh, school 25% of the children will be from uh, economically weaker sections of society many schools don't follow that uh, so just to implement that and also children who go in how do you prepare those children better uh, because you know suddenly they they are thrown in a public school environment which is very different so how do you prepare those children better how do you coach them counsel them how do you ensure that every school is following that digit diligently not only in delhi but across india <coughs> so working with that ngo providing them financial support helping them build the infrastructure for doing that so the multiplier impact of that of the policies that the government has defined or the infrastructure that the government has created the multiplier impact of that is huge and that's where we are trying to work thank you so much for answering that sir. the work that you just told us about is completely inspirational that is thank you so much and with that that was our last question thank you so much for sharing your experiences and your wisdom i'm sure everyone every attendee has a lot to take away from today's conversation thank you so much for joining us today sir thank you thank you very much wish you all the very best lots of success in life thank you sir thank you very much thanks Can I leave now? Uh, would you just like you to uh, say a few words about uh, the annual finance journal so that we can uh, officially launch it? Yeah, no, no. I would, I would definitely. Uh, so this is the. Uh, I'm. Uh, uh, so this is the uh, the 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 journal and and congratulations to all of you for putting this together. Uh, you know, I uh, the 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 three big issues that I I saw you address in this. Uh, i think are the biggest three issues today the world is facing so i think you've talked a lot about sustainability we covered that in our conversation also you talked about the impact of digital and technology and you talked about geopolitical issues and today frankly these are the three biggest issues so 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 compliments to the editorial board compliments to the uh, people who have written this article uh, for selecting those issues i also believe for all those uh, uh, students who have written this youngsters who have written these articles a lot of them have been contributed by them um, uh, you know when you write an article the level of preparation that you go through 
uh, is very significant and uh, you know you just can't write like that and i think that in itself is a big uh, uh, big motivation and that in itself is a great education experience plus all the you know students who are who are reading this and also you know outside of the student community people who read this i'm sure this is of 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 great value and i think this is reflective uh, of the high standards of uh, of sri ram college of commerce so compliments for keeping the flag flying high and uh, and for really coming out with an outstanding publication thank you so much for your kind words sir thank with you. this we present the much awaited launch video for vita 2022 I would now like to invite Ms. Bhavya Bansal, the teacher advisor of FIC SRCC, to extend the official vote of thanks. I must say it has been an honor to be part of this wonderful launch event. On behalf of the in finance and investment cell, I'd like to extend my heartfelt gratitude to our esteemed chief guest, Mr. Rajiv Memani, the chairman and regional managing par uh, partner of EBA India. Having you here is an honor, and we're really grateful for all your. deep words of uh, wisdom insights you gave in all the areas of economics your politics all the uh, way you answered all the questions and enhance helps help in enhancing knowledge to the students since your appreciation to the departmental heads also who have managed the event from beginning to end a hearty round of applause and gratitude to all the members and expert speakers who contributed to the success of, on the occasion and publication Finally I want to thank everyone in attendance coming out today and helping us to make this event a huge success thank you thank you so much for your kind words ma'am uh, like every year we pride making with the an enjoyable and enriching read for all finance enthusiasts our months of research surveys and hard work is now yours hope all you uh, hope you all find with the a good read thank you so much for being here have a good day ahead